Good evening, everyone. Time for another member update. This is the daily chart of silver, and you can see that we have a break in this downtrend line, but we've had many breaks. I pointed them out before. Um, but this one, we got a bounce off of it, and it seems to be rallying. We'll see if it can actually get out of this cup and saucer formation. Have to remember that it's fighting off a big area of resistance here sitting at about well roughly 16 uh, but you can see that it goes from right there to really a test here and now we're in this another test that test was higher but of course it gives us a, a break of that trend line um, so it's a significant test if we can uh, if we can get through 16 and up to 17 um, it could do some backing and filling. It could turn around and go down from here, but uh, it could be very, very choppy for some time trying to get through that because there is a lot of resistance there. Now, that resistance is, how valid is it? Well, again, how valid is a, a fake paper market? No one can really say for sure. Now, I wanted to spend the rest of the time on this Scotia Makata 2016 silver forecast because I think there's a lot of information here that's really interesting. So I'm just going to read through this now. We know this is the Scotia Makata that uh, I think, let me see if they're associated with Scotia Bank. Uh, Scotia Makata. Uh, they might have, yeah, Scotia. It is Scotia Bank. <clears throat> so it's it's one of the notorious players. In my opinion, I I think it's part of the deal. I think everybody's in on it actually. But it's interesting to look at some of the things they cite here. So I'm just going to read through this and comment. Uh, this is the forecast. This is for 2016 forecast. Government stocks continue to fall. Sales of government-held stocks have fallen sharply since 2010. Indeed, in 2014, they seem to have dried up completely. Between 2003 and 2010, sales averaged around 1660 tons. Now, I'm going to do some math here, but just keep in mind that it's that's every ton is 32,000 ounces. And we'll do a conversion here to uh, dollars in a little bit. So the removal of this supply is meaningful. Since 2007, most of the official sales have come from Russia, but the fact that sales dropped in 2011 when average prices were at a record high suggests that either Russia's stockpiles have been depleted or that in line with gold buying for its official reserves, it may have decided that silver would complement its gold holdings. Now that's kind of strange. Why would Russia be dumping silver? It doesn't really amount to any amount of money. Uh, at the at these low prices, even though dollar silver prices have been low this year, Russia would have had a massive incentive to sell stockpiled piled silver earlier in the year, when the ruble price increased to 1,250 ruble from around 700 ruble an ounce in 2014. So for now, Russia, China, and India, who have been main sellers in recent years, all seem to have stopped selling, and we expect that to remain the case in the year ahead. Now, that kind of logic doesn't make really a lot of sense. The We're talking about the ruble losing a lot of its value. We know that that happened. Uh, it coincided exactly with the NATO's move into the Ukraine, and that government and currency completely collapsing. Um, then sanctions being placed on Russia, etc. So we know that it's the the ruble being destroyed by the Western powers, not um, silver. Any real change in the price of silver? It's a change in the in in the ruble. Now what they're saying here is that well, with a ruble price being so high, they have a big temptation to sell their silver. Not really, because the price even in the higher ruble rate. Uh, with the ruble losing whatever percentage it was, it's still no amount of money. So that's a bogus argument, and I don't know why they make arguments like that. Now, let's look at this producer hedging. Uh, keep in mind that the tons is 32,000 ounces. I'm going to show you uh, 
how little this is. Producers added 492 tons of hedges in 2014, taking the total hedge book to 919 tons. Considering how much further prices have fallen this year, there may not have been many opportunities for producers to put on hedges. Well, I'll, I'll come back and comment on all this. Earlier in the year, prices ran up to $18 an ounce, which is likely to have attracted some hedging, but prices did not stay above that level for long. Without many opportunities to put on more hedges, producers are likely to start suffering more as hedges become prompt and have not been replaced. That said, with the hedges likely to have been put on by producers of silver as a byproduct, we doubt the lack of hedges on its own will lead to production cuts but lower base metal prices may. At 919 tons, the hedge book covers around just 3.4% of annual mine output. The likelihood of low levels of hedging in 2016 will mean hedging does not become a major influence on total supply. So what is producer hedging? Uh, well, we've, we've talked about the futures markets before and how they work and how they originated in the crops such as soybeans, corn, oats, wheat, and they gave the producer the ability to lock in a price by selling forward their crop. So same thing with people who mine silver. They can sell it in the future, which normally prices, sometimes the the uh, curve is inverted, uh, but generally it's a flat curve. So if, if the price of silver is around 15 bucks now, then it's going to be fairly close to that in the future. So if you think that prices may fall for, further, uh, you can sell your future production, which of course you haven't produced yet, lock in today's or close to today's price, sell it out in the future. So basically that means that Producer hedgers are the people who actually mine silver. That's what we're talking about here. Now, what's interesting about this is that only 3.4% of annual mine output is covered by this hedge book. So that means that 96.6% of all silver is sold at whatever the price that is, market price. Now, why is this important? Well, because First of all, 492 tons comes out to be some tiny amount of silver. Uh, I did the math already. I don't remember uh, what I came up with because I converted to dollars. And then the 919 tons, if you convert to dollars at current prices, uh, that comes to about half a billion dollars. So uh, it was a couple million ounces, I think. So it's not, uh, actually, let's just divide by $15 price. I'm sorry, it was 29 million ounces. So that 919, that hedge book is 29 million ounces. And again, that's less than half a billion dollars. So first thing to note here is that with this hedge book being so tiny, it's kind of amazing that something so small could determine an entire world silver market price. And then of course the other thing is that only 3.4% of the determination of the price is by miners uh, hedging it. Now this language that they give here saying that uh, without many opportunities to put on more hedges, now that's nonsense. There's always an opportunity to put on a hedge uh, they could put hedges on right now at $15. In fact, they could hedge all of next year's supply at $15. So what are they saying? Are they saying that prices have to rise from here? Uh, we'll see that they kind of say something like that as we get a little bit further. In 2014, global supply of 33,000 tons, there's your total global supply, was considerably larger than fabrication demand of 27,000 tons in theory meaning a supply surplus of around 6,000 tons, but the actual balance then depends on investor interest. In 2014, ETFs bought a net 110 tons, but investors bought 6,000 tons of coins and bars, 
which meant the market needed to draw down 262 tons from inventory. Now that's very interesting. Let's look at this chart from SRS Rocco. And this is a chart of silver coin sales over the years. And you can see this is in millions of ounces. So this chart compared to the silver chart is very interesting because while the silver chart makes a top in 2011 and then just drops all the way down to where it is today, the official silver coin sales have continued to rise and have actually risen into record levels here, right? They're setting a record in 2015. So we're seeing silver, real silver purchase purchasers actually becoming the real market. Uh, ETFs, I don't even know if that's real silver being purchased. Uh, it could be fake money buying fake silver. But you can see that it's absolutely dwarfed now by the real investor demand. So we'll continue. As such, even though ETF interest in 2014 was minimal, the silver market in 2014 was in a small supply deficit. In 2015, we expect supply to drop 4% as mine output and scrap de scrap decline due to low prices and as byproduct silver production falls in line with base metal production cuts. Now we've talked about scrap before and uh, they're saying that scrap will decline due to low prices. In other words, it's not going to be recycled. Now actually I've pointed out before that that's not really the case as certainly if we're talking about uh, scrap from say junk silver and you can see here uh, at compare silver prices here that we still have a on 90% bags we still have a 23% 23 to 24% premium across the board so people are paying a quarter more that means if silver is 15 bucks they're paying uh, what is that three and a half bucks more uh, how are you going to get scrap out of that who is going to turn around and uh, scrap that when they can sell the coin itself for a, a lot more that doesn't make sense so it I don't think that scrap declines due to low prices uh, scrap declines uh, due to having a higher price you can sell it for a higher real price for demand we expect growth of around four percent with growth being seen from the solar panel jewelry and silverware sector this would lead to supply of 30,000 tons fabrication of 28,000 tons and a supply surplus before investment demand of 2,000 tons in the year up to late November, holdings in ETFs dropped 451 tons, but demand for coins and bars is expected to have remained strong, growing 2% to 6,000 tons, leaving a net deficit of 2,900 tons. Our forecast for 2016 is for mine supply to fall 5%, but for scrap supply to rebound 10% as we expect a rebound in prices to release more scrap into the market. That's a pretty bold expectation for scrap to increase that much. Uh, as I said, not only does the silver price have to increase, but uh, the premium for, for junk and other things like that, that has to decrease. This would lead total supply to fall 2.7% to 30,000 tons. We expect low silver prices and a slight recovery in economic activity to see demand grow 2% to 28,000 tons, giving a surplus before investment activity of 1,401 tons. As has become the norm, the final supply demand balance will depend on the level in investment activity, with, but with low prices and potential for prices to recover, we would expect that demand for coins and bars to grow, even if holdings in ETS continue to edge lower. As such, we expect a bigger supply deficit next year as investment and fabrication demand grow while supply falls. Now, why would holdings in ETFs edge lower? Why would not people who have these billions and tens and hundreds of billions of dollars of investment dollars on Wall Street uh, not, if, if as they say here, silver is expected to rise in price, why wouldn't they take advantage of that and buy ETFs? So 
that's pretty shady as well. The whole thing is shady, and uh, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, Scotia Makata or Scotia Bank, uh, they're actually involved in in the suppression. But if we think about the amounts of money that we're talking about here, we're talking about amounts of money that are so infinitesimally small. We're talking about half a billion dollars of total producer hedging for the entire silver market in the entire world, a half a billion dollars. What a tiny amount of money that is. What a tiny amount of silver that is uh, to control the entire market and then to have 97% of the silver that's sold. Uh, it's not producer hedging. It's just apparently the producers are just dumping this byproduct on the market. So it's, it's fairly clear that they are still maintaining this strategy of just dumping whatever silver they have uh, mining it as a byproduct and uh, the only thing that can really change this scenario is if people step up and start to buy the coins because I personally believe the ETFs are fake uh, the there's no way of knowing until the whole thing blows up but uh, the amount of coins that we're talking about here you can see 130 million coins um, you do the math what is that one to two billion dollars Again, that is a tiny drop in the bucket of what people spend. What if that num number doubled? That number could double without even having a noticeable impact on anyone. What if that number went tenfold? That number could go tenfold. Um, but it's only going to happen if people wake up. People are waking up. You can see that uh, they did drop off and slow down their buying when they put in that silver top. Uh, the silver smash down of 2011 you can see the next year it did drop but then it popped right up back up in 2013 and has risen up to a new high so I believe this number will keep rising as more and more people wake up and uh, as that happens uh, I don't believe the scrap is going to come online I don't believe that the premiums are going to correct and I believe that the supply deficits are just going to get worse and worse and worse and we'll talk to you next time.